Hello and welcome to our series, We Bajans, where we profile outstanding Barbadians who have made a significant contribution to this country's development. Certainly, Dr. Jean Holder has served this country with distinction in the areas of foreign service, tourism, and civil aviation. Jean Stewart Holder was born to Lauriston and Alma Holder on March 28, 1935 at Bank Hall, St. Michael. His father was a teacher and pastor, while his mother was a housewife. The third of seven children, he is the only boy. He received his early education at Robert Primary. After securing a scholarship, he ventured to Combermere School for two years. His erudition was so evident that he won another scholarship, this time to Harrison College, where he completed his secondary education. In 1954, he won a Barbados scholarship in classics and enrolled at the prestigious Oxford University, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in 1959 and a Master of Arts degree in 1962. It was while at Oxford University that he met a beautiful, gifted Jamaican student, Norma Joy Ione Edmondson, who was to become the love of his life. She had graduated from the University of the West Indies at Mona and came to Oxford on a Carnegie Fellowship to pursue another degree in chemistry. The two were married while he was posted to Oslo in 1961. Norma later became the principal of the Barbados Community College. Their union produced two daughters, Janet and Carolyn. Jean Holder studied diplomacy and international relations and received practical training in the British Foreign Service. This body established a London office in June 1962. He was then posted as a third secretary to the British Embassy in Oslo, Norway. In the 1960s, Caribbean countries, long tired of their colonial masters, were on a trajectory towards independence. By June 1962, Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago were actively moving away from British colonial rule. Although faced with many obstacles, Premier Barrow pursued independence with a singular focus. Mr. Barr decided at the beginning of 1966 that he wasn't really confident that he could arrive at a solution that would get Barbados independent uh, in a hurry. And he decided that he would go it alone. Well, that started another... <laughs> that started another very, very bitter discussion in Barbados about whether Barbados could actually uh, afford to manage independence on its own. Either, be, either with its human resources or its uh, natural resources. And uh, of course, Mr. Barr was very determined that it could. And um, I have to say that I was strongly supported in. Ago, the people of this country saw the end of a state of dependency on Great Britain and the realization of their hopes and aspirations when at midnight last night the territory became an independent state within the Commonwealth of Nations. Now, in 1966, then Premier Errol Barrow appointed you publicity officer for the then conference to decide Barbados' independence. Could you tell us what this entailed? I was, I thought, extremely fortunate to have been asked by Mr. Barrow to assume the responsibilities of press and publicity officer for the conference and to attend the conference. and. Um, to be responsible not only for briefing the British and the West Indian press, but also um, for drafting reports for him to, um, 
to approve uh, to be released in the Caribbean. The year 1973 proved to be a pivotal one for him when an ad for creating a new type of tourism agency caught his eye. Now in the 1970s, your career went into the realm of tourism, regional tourism to be precise. If you could tell us, especially about your years at the Caribbean Tourism Organization and where you were adjudged to be among the 50 most influential people in regional tourism, what did this entail? I expressed an interest. I, I, I think I, was, I probably was looking for a change from the Foreign Service. I had been in the Foreign Service activity for 14 years, and I thought that um, perhaps I needed a change. I felt that I had the, um, the ability to um, get things done. You know, let me just say this, huh? although it seemed strange that I should have thought that I um, could do a job that essentially seemed like a tourism job. Um, I think that my 14 years in diplomacy had given me skills, very largely negotiating skills, skills to getting people to do things done that I thought needed to be done and so on. So while I didn't have any tourism experience, I thought that I had the experience which was required for this kind of job. Because it was a job that really initially had nothing to do with tourism. It had to do with creating uh, an agency, uh, designing an agency, selecting the kind of, of economists and statisticians and people of that kind who were never, ever in any way associated with tourism prior to that. Uh, to that period of time. For his outstanding service to the region and internationally in tourism, he has received a bevy of awards, including the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Award in 1985 and the CTO Award for Excellent Service to Caribbean Tourism. In 1995, he was presented with a Life Achievement Award by the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association. Not one to resist a change, tourism propelled him to wrestle with yet another major challenge. In 2004, your career also went into another direction in terms of regional air transportation, precisely as chairman of LIAC. If you could tell us about the many challenges that you face as chairman. An airline is an extremely complicated activity, and people are surprised when I say to them, that every single major legacy carrier in the United States has been bankrupt in the last 10 years. Every one, the last one was American Airlines and American Eagle, which has not flown in the Caribbean since then. But they all point to the fact that Liat loses money, which Liat has done. And I'm not making excuses for some of the things that Liat does because I really believe that Liat can do a lot better than it does. Um, but having said that, um, there are many, many aspects to um, air transportation. You have obviously the, the cost factor. And the cost factor is affected, or has been for years, largely by fuel costs. Um, it has been affected in the region. Liat has a very small fleet, and it's supposed to service 21 different countries, little countries with very small markets, separated by water every day. And the only four countries support it financially. Um, and the, uh, the rest of the 21 are fairly adamant that they're not putting any money in Liat. But if Liat does not show up on any one day, it is hell to pay. You're also credited to be one of the first chairman 
of the National Independence Festival of Creative Arts. You really enjoy the arts. If you could tell us what gives you joy and why you decided to you know, take that direction in terms of being involved in the creative arts. Perhaps one of the most important things I will mention about NIFCA was that as with CTRC and CTO and so on, what was critical was not just starting the festival, but ensuring that it could be financed. You know, a lot of people come along and they say, well, we're going to start things. And you say, but how are you going to maintain it financially? And say, well, we really didn't think about that. Well, um, that is always something that I have been able to make a contribution to. And um, I went to Mr. Barr and I said, you know, this festival, if it's going to be maintained, it needs to be financed every year. And therefore, um, what we need to do is to do it under the, and I am a civil servant, um, and he's a prime a minister, said, my business is to give him advice on these matters. You need to finance it under the independence vote. So every year when independence comes around and money is being voted for um, independence activity, you put some money in for NIFCA. And that is why NIFCA is called the National Independence Festival of the Creative Arts. The I is for independence. And that was to ensure that it could be financed uh, under um, the government's financial program. He has been at the helm of many organizations. He was the chairman of the Barbados Dance Theatre Company from 1969 to 1974 and a director on many boards, including Cave Shepherd and Company Limited and Duty Free Caribbean, the Caribbean Hotel Association, the Caribbean Tourism Organization and Special Olympics. For his outstanding contribution at home and abroad, he has also been presented with numerous awards, including the Distinguished Guest and Recipient of the Key to the City of Lima, Peru in 1973, Member of the Royal Victorian Order in 1975. He was also conferred with a Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa in 1998 by the University of the West Indies and in 2000 he was honoured by the government with the Barbados Centennial Honour as one of the persons who have contributed to this country's development in the last 100 years. Although an octogenarian, Gene Holder is still very active. In fact, a prolific writer, he has penned three books, a biography of national hero and father of independence, the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow, a book on air transportation, Don't Burn Our Bridges, the case for Owen Airlines, and one on the history of tourism in the Caribbean called Caribbean Tourism. He has also published over 150 articles on tourism. And now at this juncture of his life, Dr. Holder can reflect on his contribution to Barbados and the region with much pride. His legacy is assured. He joins the list of Barbadians who have achieved the pinnacle of success in their lifetime. To him, we extend our sincerest gratitude. And that's where we end another edition of We Bajans, where we profile the life and times of Dr. Jean Holder, another outstanding Barbadian who has made a significant contribution to this country's development. I'm Kathy Lashley. Thanks for joining us and goodbye. welcome your feedback on our programs. You may email your comments to bgisfeedback at barbados.gov.bb. You may also view our website at www.gisbarbados.gov.bb or subscribe to our YouTube channel, The BGIS.